Hello. Today we're looking at some um, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition. Something out of here. And today we're taking on the mighty, mighty task of handling what's it called? Non-lethal and weaponless combat procedures. So here's a quick look at what it all looks like. So buckle up, you're in for a ride. And those of us who are, who are still with us at the end, oh, good luck. We'll be only going over the pummeling and the grappling, but Let's get it on. So, starting from the top, I'll go through the actual procedure on how this happens once we've got all the numbers calculated. But what we're going to be doing is looking at these charts, which don't make a lot of sense initially, if at all. And then we'll go over the pummeling and the grappling. So grappling is like wrestling, pummeling is punching and kicking. All right, so looking at our character from before, Dwarven Fighter Thief, you're gonna need some pencil, some paper, a fair bit of patience, work out what needs to be done and while we're at it, we'll work out what modifiers for the defense. So attack is dexterity per point. This is for punching. So you've got a percentage chance to hit. It's all in percent, which seems counterintuitive, but it's all in percent. So the attack is dexterity per point plus one percent. So this is to hit. So we say plus. 14 Attacker's strength per point over 15 which no have Attacker's AC per point with negative AC being based on a positive by type I'll explain that in a second So this particular character is a thief leather armor if we're fighting whilst wearing leather armor with an armor class of 8 it's a plus 8 what the negative means is if you've got a negative 5 armor class if you manage to pick up a, a plus 5 shield with a plus 5 suit of chainmail armor you're going to have a very very negative armor class but your base armor class is 4 because it's chain and shield. Chain and shield is a base armor class of four, and it doesn't matter if you've got the plus five and the plus five and, and whatever else. So we're looking at, at that. So this is in order to hit. So what it's sort of suggesting is that if you're in chainmail armor, you have a less, you're a bit more cumbersome, a bit more bulky, and so on. So the more armor you have, the the less likely you are to effectively hit, but is offset obviously by strength and dexterity. And we're talking bits of percent. So this is to hit. Then we've got opponent as a minus 12. Well, she doesn't have over 12 inch movement, so that's not a problem. So in terms of defense, nothing to apply here for being punched, but for punching, plus 14 and potentially plus 8 if punching while wearing armor. The second part of the chart list is once we've once the, the hit has been made, there's a roll on another chart. Attacker's strength per point over 12, which was nothing, because the character has 12 strength. and everything else. Now here we go, active defender per point over 14, 
14 decks. Leather or padded armor, minus 10. So in terms of defense, when the, de when the damage roll is being made, this character can apply minus 10 to the opponent because wearing leather armor. As you can see, if you're wearing plate mail, it's minus 40%, meaning that it's harder to, you might hit someone easy, but then damaging them and doing anything effectively is the problem. So, we move over to grappling. For the attacker, attacker's dexterity per point, plus one. To hit is now plus 14. The defender's armor is da 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 da. So when you're grappling, you're wrestling. So the heavier the person's armor, the easier it is to actually wrestle them and pin them and put them in locks and holds. So for her defense, we'll put that as plus 10 because she wears leather herself. Opponent's not going to be faster, but it's handy to know. Opponent hasted. Now onto the damage, similar sort of scenario. Take his dexterity per point. Plus 14. Take his strength per point. Plus 12. Opponent's load, opponent helpless, opponent to help, so on. And this is where some of the weight and height differences come in. If we look at the back of the first edition, we've got here height and weight. So the opponent that I'm thinking putting her up against is this one, 5'6 versus 3'10. So there's a height difference, weight difference, a little bit, 130 to a 150. So when up against the, when looking at that, there will be a modification of plus and minus based on height and weight. So the taller and heavier you are, the easier you are to, to affect the other person. Which is very, very conditional. So we'll just make note of the, the things. Here we go. So opponent strength. Pet point over 12, she's got 12, so it doesn't matter. Opponent wearing banded or plate. Nope, 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 nope. Okay. We have these little bits here. We can write some things down and we'll make some extra notes on the side. I'll do the same thing for this character. Then we'll have a quick run through on a few rounds of punching. They're both first level, so they're both going to have eight hit points each, I think. They both have eight. Yep. 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 So it'll be a pretty quick battle. All right, let me get everything finished and then we'll be back. Okay, so I've written them down. I've got modifiers for in their armor and out of their armor. Right next to that chain. In brackets. So 24, 23, 12, 28, 26, plus 20 to hit. Yep, so all there. The conditional modifiers are things like base movement differences, which neither of them have. They're both, there's a three inch difference. So Tyrion has a 
minus 10 grappling because he's 9, she's 12 if they've got in their armour out of their armour that doesn't exist so that sort of depends on how everyone's deciding to do it if it's a, a cage match or a uh, prize fighting where everyone's stripped down to their unders and off they go then a lot of these are these conditions are just based, you know, are very similar. There were zeros. So what we're looking at is for grappling and pummeling, pummeling and grappling, grappling and pummeling. We go by dexterity. So where this all sits inside the normal initiative order is at the end, the last thing that can happen. If you've got weapons, they all go first. And then comes the unarmed and uh, weaponless combat. It's actually listed as non-lethal. So on paper that would also include if you were trying to use the flat of your blade to subdue an opponent. That would also come after everything else. So as it's written with the non-lethal combat, you can sometimes try and subdue an opponent, uh, force them into submission, uh, take, taking control of uh, a minotaur and turning it into a pet. Dragons are always good, that sort of thing. And there are rules for putting things into submission and subduing them. And that all uses non-lethal combat. So on paper, non-lethal combat happens at the end of everything else. So you're putting yourself at risk in order to protect or to, you know, to, uh, to subdue without excessive force. It's a lot easier is what they're saying to get in there and start stabby stabby. So what we have here is just two opponents and we're using, as I said before, percentile dice. So we'll start with some pummeling. 14 decks versus 12 decks. So the little dwarf goes first. And what we see is that if she's in her armor, she gets a plus 22. So the base armor class to hit with pummeling is the opponent's armor class times by 10. So 40% plus 22, 62% chance of hitting. So 86 over the 62 fails to hit. Tyrion attacking back. So this is in the first round of combat still. 80% chance of hitting plus enough. 18, so it's 95, yeah, so it's just a 95% chance. And gets a 98. Okay, so in the first combat round, in the first combat part, both have missed. There are two elements, there are two combats. So now Balrimi gets another attack. 67. She needed 62. And Tyrion punching back, 55. So he hits, he punches, and successfully hits. Now the next is the damaging, the, the pummeling table modifier. This tells us what's actually happening here. He's got plus four. Rolls a 78. Consult the chart, that goes to 82. Solid punch, strike again. Eight plus strength bonus. 
So 16 strength goes to 9. So here we go, with one punch, he's actually knocked her out because she has 8 hit points. So the 9 points of damage being done, one quarter is actual damage and the rest is sub, what's called subdual damage. So of 9 points, 2 will be solid hit point damage and the 7 will be this sort of fluffy points of damage, but a total of 9. So our hit points goes to 6, but the amount of subdual damage she's received is more than what she has, so which is only sends her, she still has 6 hit points, but she's unconscious. When, you, when your subdual points are greater than your actual hit points, you get knocked out. Which is exactly what happens here. So at first level, as I said, they've both got 8 hit points and so combat's pretty furious. That was one punch. Smack. Down. But as you can imagine, 3 or 4 levels down the, tr down the line, when you've got a lot more hit points, these punches, they sort of make up they can uh, keep on uh, keep on going. What would normally happen is that at the end of the round the subdual damage is healed at one point at the end of every round, just the subdual damage. So if she did not receive enough to knock her out, at the end of the round one point would have come back off. So in pummeling You're using the Defender's Armour class, times by 10. And then the modifier to hit, followed by percentile roll, modified by strength, dexterity, and some conditions. And that tells us how much damage. Now remember this is subdual damage where 25% is actual damage and 75% is the subject is the non lethal damage. That's the head mess. The head mess is really the chart because it looks tricky and the head mess is the fact that it's percentile rather than d20. Everything else for combat in this game is obviously d20, d20 for saving throws and so on. So there are, when it's a different value, it can upset the apple cart for some people. The next thing we'll do is look at some grappling. And maybe uh, maybe we'll get some justice for Bolremi afterward. Once I've gone up a few levels, it's, um, yeah, those extra hit points. And this is where, from a, a cinematic point of view, when you see the hero and the bad guy throw down their weapons and go toe to toe and punch each other, it's an incredibly even battle. Because these stat values rarely change. They do change, but they rarely change, and by much. And so these attacking and defending values will hardly ever change. Uh, the armor class might go up or down by bits of percent but for the most part you're looking at everything being all sorted so the next one we'll do is grappling hi there all right, here we are, grappling. Okay, so the difference between grappling and, and pummeling is that uh, clearly with, when you do your first pummeling attack, you're able to make two pummeling attacks because there are two pummeling attacks in a round, but you can only do one grappling attack. So you can't do a pummeling attack and then a grappling attack. If you start with your pummeling attack, you need to continue pummeling. If you start with a grapple attack, well, you're just grappling. We've already gone through the modifiers. 
And again, it's a chart. This is always a chart. We love charts. Especially when they sometimes don't make sense. And now we work out who's doing what. So again, it's in dexterity as the initiative order. So Balrimi goes first. And Balrimi is at minus 15 because of the height difference and minus 10. But that doesn't come till later. To begin with, multiply the attacker's armor class. So she's got an 80% chance of doing a correct wrestling move, or of at least getting potential chance, modified by an additional 30 for chain, because you're the opponent's in chainmail armor. So we're talking big modifying differences between what we were doing before in pummeling. She rolls. 34. Alright, so she's hit. Now she gets her modifiers for the next set of rolls, which include plus 26 for her damage adjustment and minus 25 for her weight and height difference. Minus 15 for being shorter by a lot and minus 10 for being uh, lighter by a fair, by a little bit. So the 26, 25, so she gets a plus one modifier to the next roll to work out what she does here. She's got an 04, goes to 05. So nothing, waste clinch, opponent may counter. So the opponent automatically gets an opportunity to counter because that's what that roll represents. In which case, Tyrion goes straight into a counter with his modifier of 28 plus the 25. So he's already going straight up. And he gets a two. plus 53, so it goes to a hand or finger lock. So she's gone in to try and grab the opponent around the waist. He's grabbed her by the hand and put her in a hand or in a finger lock. And now she takes two damage. She's two damage? Two damage. Plus strength, so that's three. So she takes three damage. She goes from eight to five. That was a Balrimi's turn, because he got to counter. Now his turn, he still rolls on this. She's already held, so that's an automatic hold. What he does now is he rolls to see whether he gets better than a hand or finger lock. 01, which he doesn't. So he gets to apply the hand or finger lock again for another three points of damage. Next round, while Remy's held in the hand or finger lock, this one, she makes an attack like normal. Eight, because it goes by the attacker's defense, eight and so on, so she's got the super attack in this one. <laughs> one, that's a very, I am rolling these dice. So she hits, that's a hit by the way. Now, she's already in a hand finger lock. She gets plus one as a difference. Much better, 75. which goes to 76. Because the hand and finger lock is here and 76 is down here, and because she's held, she's on the other side of the double slash. She's on the other side of this slash. So she gets to flip or throw 
Tyrion. And break out of the hand and finger lock, plus inflict five points of damage onto him. The first part before the slashes are the, are the locks and holds. If you've already got a lock or a hold, you're rolling to see whether you can apply a better lock or a hold. So an arm lock can be beaten by anything that's over. But if you've got a stranglehold on someone, the only thing that will get, well actually, there is, once you're in a stranglehold, that is the highest hold. They can't actually get out of that. What they can do is damage based on these other things here. That's why there are no holds over from the 95 or over. It's a straight up kick, knee, and gouge. If you're in a stranglehold and someone then rolls a 96, 95 or higher, or 96 or higher, then you've gouged into their face to pull them out of the hold and so on. But we haven't gotten out of the hold really. If you're in a hold, so let's say for instance you're in a bear hug, and you're being squeezed, you are able to bite, elbow smash, because that's on a for, uh, forearm or, or elbow smash, which is on the other side of the double slash. If you're in a bear hug, you can trip your opponent up, get out of it. If you're in a bear hug, you can get out of it by flipping or throwing the opponent, by headbutting the opponent, and so on. So in this instance, she's done five damage. She was in the handlock. She flipped or threw Tyrion, inflicting five damage. And he does one real damage. And again, the same deal at the end of every combat round, the one subdual point gets healed. Doesn't sound like a lot, but once you've got a few hit points, you can, it can make, a, make quite a difference. And then the next round we do it again and so on. It's his turn, her turn, her turn, his turn, blah. So on paper, looks a little tricky, it's quite cumbersome. Now, I'm going to throw in another head mess in a second and we'll get to, uh, get to that once we've added the next character. So the next thing we're looking at here, we have Balrimi here and her new opponent let's wipe out the old damage her new opponent is going to be a monk of no name not yet anyway see how it goes he she he he six foot Bit of a height difference apart from that. Weight's about the same. Tall and lanky. Anyway. So monks handle all of this completely different. One simple reason. They have what's called an open hand attack. The open hand attack is a weapon, always considered a weapon. It has weapon modifiers against armor and does a damage. So as you can imagine, the first thing that happens in a combat round
the monk and the thief are about to go toe to toe and hand to hand, the monk goes first. Two monks, it's obviously just like weapons, just roll the initiative and da da da, everything else is the same. But again, in this instance, non lethal, weaponless comes after weapon. So the monk needs a 12 or higher, misses, now Balrimi has almost all the exact same modifiers she had before. So her unarmed combat. The opponent's armor class value, it's a hundred percent. It's the difference for them to attack the monk. It's just a matter of uh, sock them in the jaw. 65, which hits, even with all the other modifiers. Now the monk would still get some defenses, still because it's still being attacked. So if the opponent gets dexterity adjustments, active def being an active defender, and so on. And as you can imagine, they're a little bit more, oh, probably got a few more stats that are higher. The defender's armor class is usually about 10, but that'll go down every level, and so on. So then with the pummeling, her point of dexterity over 14, so she's at minus, the monk applies a minus one to, and I think for Balrimi, for 54. We look at the 54, Glancing blow, strike again. Four plus. So almost entirely knocked out. And she gets the strike again. 68, which she hits. 18, or 81, sorry. Solid punch, strike again. So this is still the first attack. What can happen with these pummeling tables, you'll see Strike again, strike again, strike again, off balance, opponent stunned. Strike again, strike again, strike again. Yeah. So remember, irrespective of level, these effects happen. So sure, the 10th level fighter might have 100 hit points, where all of this means mostly nothing, but that first level fighter, with a higher dexterity that goes first, could truly knock out an opponent. With a single punch. So as you can see, monks in themselves are still quite weak. They have lower hit points than a fighter or a fighter types. And they even though they have good hits and they can do have a wide variety of weapons and they're a good backup fighter as a frontline fighter yeah, if they don't hit first so the question is what does this do? does this detract from the monk being good at what they do? the answer is no because they're doing real damage as opposed to subdual damage they attack first they can still choose to do subdual damage. So the monk could still, if the monk hits, could still say, I do subdual damage. And it's one to two, three to four, five to six for the D3. So that'd be one point of subdual damage. But you just don't get any of the extra options. Monks have their own special rules. So if we roll for a, to hit on a monk, let's get a real roll, shall we? So we we're looking at the monk having a, from a first level monk, taking on armor class 8, needing a 12 or higher. Let's give the monk some help. So there you go, 12, where hey, we rolled a 12. That's a hit. The monk has the option 
well not the option, but the opportunity of hitting five points above the required number will automatically stun the opponent. So where all this comes in is as the monk progresses, so you get a first level, the monk being brand new, is still susceptible to a punch in the head and being knocked out. And knocked out with as much an equal value as if the person was trying to punch and knock out someone else. At higher levels, it's a different ball game as the monk to hit value increases, the hand to hand damage increases, the number of attacks increase, the hit points increase, etc. And that's experience. That's what it comes down to. There are many optional rules and house rules for weaponless and subdual combat. And yes, this on the face of it looks like something that DMs have to really work with and it helps if the players already have a lot of the information at hand to be able to calculate what they need. So all that's required are the different variables. Things like when the, someone's attacking a monk on a grapple, they automatically get a minus 10 at first level anyway. Then as the monk increases, the movement increases and so on. So they become more slipperier to grab hold of. So that's in a pummeling scenario. In a grappling situation, the monk rolls to hit because the monk goes first as a weapon. 17, that's a hit and a stun. So we'll just call it a hit. Borumi takes three points of real damage or three points of damage and in a normal world would be stunned for a number of rounds but what we're looking at here is uh, just doing the grappling attack Balrimi, the dwarf plus 14 going by the attacker's armor class she's got an 80% chance the defender's armor protection is nothing but it's minus 10 because the three inch difference in their movement and if it was Tyrion doing a grapple against the monk that would be minus 20% because the Tyrion in chainmail armor has a movement of 9 versus a 15. So Balrimi gets 69 plus 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 so that's that's a hit now onto the damage or now onto the grab 99 which is a kick knee or a gouge so straight away big hit boom some thanks for coming eight points of damage and they're down again let's put into something that we want to look at the Monk gets put into a lock or a hold. Takes the moderate damage. That's the end of the combat round. Next combat round. Because we're in unarmed, we're in weaponless combat, the monk still gets to attack exactly like normal. In a normal scenario where you have an armed, someone who's... Uh, I got a long sword and they get over there and being hit by 12 goblins who just jump on top of them or they have uh, you know a, a, a cage fight match with uh, another character and it's prize fighting and so on all of that they're just held they're held they're locked and so on and you have to use this to get out of it whereas Put into a hand or finger lock. Yep, the monk takes two points of damage. But every time the monk gets to attack, gets to roll, just like normal. And gets to inflict damage, just like normal. They, their attacks are unimpeded with their open hand. 
Everyone else, if you've got a dagger in your hand and you've been wrestled, you're at a negative. You've got a negative modifier, I believe it's like minus four, if you're uh, in that state, to try and stab your opponent. So that's the difference between the monk character versus a fighter armed with a knife or a dagger or a short sword that's suddenly accosted in a back alley by three guys who just want to tackle them to the ground. The monk will always be able to have their full strikes, which helps once you start to get to the overbearing rules. But that's much like a, uh, uh, a gridiron tackle, a sack, I suppose is the closest thing to it, where you just jump on your opponent, pull them down and hold them. So it's almost purely by weight. You're knocking them over, knocking them down. And that's when you would definitely have the um, uh, like 12 goblins jumping on top of the 10th level fighter and holding them down. The 10th level fighter's at a disadvantage. Whereas the 8th level monk still gets to have all the normal attacks and do all the normal damage. That's really it. So, it's an interesting system that's different to everything else. Hopefully I've gone over it with enough. It does require some homework in terms of running through practice, do a few practice rounds, get some characters together and um, look at all the values. Because the variable values are the ones that get missed. You forget that, oh well, they've got a magical cloak or ring. And so on. Because the magic will affect, is all part of the, the, the charm of the magic to defend the character. So if you've got a magical ring of protection, or a cloak of protection, you get a modifier. On the a negative modifier on, on this roll here. So they're the sort of situational things that you just have to try and remember as a DM. And it does get a bit tricky. Now there is this other little section every time, every round. Look at that, decide whether or not you want to apply it. It does assist higher level characters. And what this does is that with every round, a special modifier is created for the attacker and the defender. So every combat between, every time you go in for a pummeling attack, you have this. Every time you go in for a pummeling, uh, like an overbearing attack, so you have this. So one pummeling attack, which may turn into three or four strikes, as we've seen over here, you would have a slight bonus. 1d6 plus one for every column that you're on. So fighters, at first level, one, two, get a plus two. D6 plus two as a modifier to their chances to hit or damage. And as a defender, they get a D4 plus that. And it, it adds something to sort of allow for the 10th level fighter to make it a little bit more difficult for the 10th level fighter to be knocked out immediately by the first level. But it's got some accounting attached to it. But if you're wanting to look at that, it, as I said, it, it allows for the more experienced characters to have an advantage. And these are numbers that, uh, you know, in bits of percent, so 1% to eight. You can have you know, up to 16% modifier for whether you, you're plus to hit or you're plus to the damage. And as a defender, minus to the hit or minus to the damage. And that's how it goes from there. So, I didn't really touch on that, but that is something that is well and truly worth looking at, especially when you start to get like those higher level characters stripping down to their shorts and just punching each other into oblivion. And your first level is lucky enough to just constantly roll stuns or strangle holds, in which case then they take six plus a strength bonus. So if you've got a high strength, you're looking at doing up to 12 points of damage. If you're a human with 18 double zero strength, 12 points of damage every single round. 
which is enough to pull anyone down after a while. And so on. So thank you very much. Hopefully I've uh, made this a bit more clearer. If you're still with me after all this time, good effort, good effort. If you use it, better effort. I do like to try and use it. It sort of adds that element. It's putting it into practice. You sometimes do find your characters to be without weapons, trapped in a jail cell with no armor, or sometimes they do want to attack without causing instant death. Because if you've got a plus five something sword and a good strength and every time when you hit something they just turn into a blood mist sometimes you don't want that so give it a shot roll up some characters put some details together and away where they go and as it says realistically this is for humans and humanoids so orcs can use you know if you're up against a dragon, they're not going to be. They've, they've got weapons. Their bite, bite claws are, are weapons. You know whether they're considered to be daggers or whatever. You know they're if you're using those weapon charts. But that's something that DM is. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you're still here. And if you like what you see, that's great. Like it, obviously. Try and put as many of these things up as possible. Tackle the more trickier questions. If you have any questions about any of this, please put it down and I'm happy to help and the community will definitely come back with, that's not how we did it, this is how we do it. And good day to everyone. Thank you. Like and subscribe, I suppose. Alright, thanks guys.